Okay, dear saints in New York City, I'm so glad we can have this time together. And um, we will have three messages in this brief conference. And you can see by looking at the outline that the overall subject, the general subject, is God's good pleasure. And um, we, I mean, at least in my experience, I've never had a conference with this title. Now, if you look at the title of this first outline, it says, God's good pleasure, what makes God happy? Uh, do you ever think of that when you hear the term God's good pleasure? Well, God's good pleasure, look at Roman number one, it says God's good pleasure, his heart's desire is to meet the demand of this age, which is God's need in this age. You see, God has a particular need in this age, in this present age. And let's say if we start with the 16th century, well, we know that the church entered into a great period of degradation, and so the Lord needed a recovery. And when we use the word recovery, we mean a restoration or a return to a normal condition after a damage or a loss has taken place. And um, so the Lord needs to uh, restore us um, and to return us to a normal condition of our Christian life and of our church life. And that is to bring us back to his original intention. That is to bring us back to his heart's desire. That is to, that is to be involved in his good pleasure, in what pleases him, in what makes him happy. So that's what we want to see in this particular message. Now, again, Roman numeral one says God's good pleasure. His heart's desire is to meet the demand of this age which is God need in this age. Now, saints, you know, those of us who have taken this way, here you are, you're the church in New York City. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I hope and I trust there's churches in New Jersey watching this and many other churches. We got captured to go this way. One of the main reasons is because we realized that God has a need. God has a need, and God has a heart's desire. We didn't take this way merely for our need to be met. Of course, when God, when we are involved in meeting God's need, our need is met according to the view of his need, of what his need is. You know, I could never forget, this was very sad to me, um, many, many years ago, uh, a couple that I knew, they, um, you know, that they actually stood up in a church meeting and said they were leaving. And they told us that they were leaving because their needs weren't being met uh, here, you know, among us. And I thought to myself, you know, we didn't come this way primarily to get our needs met. We came here to meet God's need. We never knew God had a need. Actually, he has a great need. And if we are intrinsically involved in that need, we will be the most joyful persons on the earth. You know, I realized when I got saved that, um, well, anyway, I realized very shortly that um, when, when things were in my hands, um, I didn't know what was best for me. I realized intuitively that God knew what was best for me. If I was going to be joyful in any kind of inward way, I needed to take his way. And, and eventually I realized by coming into the Lord's recovery that I needed to be involved in what his need is, what makes him happy. Now, again, let's come back to, you know, a later time in the church history. We could start with the Reformation in the... Uh, you know, with Martin Luther, and the Lord used Martin Luther to recover, at least the initial recovery, of justification by faith. 
Now, the church had degraded to such an extent that that truth was lost. People didn't know that all you had to do was to believe into the Lord Jesus Christ, receive him as your Lord and Savior, and you are justified in God's sight, which means that you are approved by God according to God's standard of righteousness, which is Christ himself, which means that when you believe in Christ, you receive Christ as your life and Savior, he becomes your righteousness. Okay, then in the 1800, I'm sorry, in the 18th century, 1700s, you have the Moravian Brethren. And, uh, you know, involved with the Ma Moravian Brethren was uh, Count Zinzendorf, and the Lord used them in, in a very wonderful way. Even they spread the truth concerning initial salvation to every corner of the world, which, which was quite marvelous. Then later, you had some people who you could say they recovered the inner life, uh, Christ as our inner life. Thank the Lord Christ as our life. So you had a person like Madame Guillaume and Father Fenelon uh, as a reaction to the deadness of the state churches that had emerged. Um, these, these saints, they focused on Christ as our inner life. And so this involved being having an organic union with God's will and the denial of the self. Now, in the early 1700s, we know that the two Wesley brothers were raised up by God. Of course, this is John Wesley, Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley was a, a great hymn writer. We have a number of our hymns in his hymnal. And John Wesley, I encourage you, if you ever go to London, to... Um, go to John Wesley's home. This is very fascinating. Across the street from his home is a, is a graveyard where um, Susanna Wesley's buried there, Isaac Watts is buried there, William Blake is, is buried there. Uh, there's many um, what you would call somewhat notable people, not just in church history, but in world history. But that... that uh, graveyard is not well kept, um, which is kind of shocking to the brother and I that went there. They're more, um, of course, they have another grave site for what they consider to be famous people. But anyway, you have John and Charles Wesley. Now, Charles Wesley was on his way to America um, at one time, and at that time, even though he knew the doctrine of justification by faith, he wasn't justified. He didn't have, he didn't actually receive the Lord as his life and as his God satisfying righteousness for his covering before God. So as they were traveling on the Atlantic, o Atlantic Ocean to the United States, there was this great storm. And uh, John Wesley was frightened to death. And he looked over in a corner of the boat, and there was this group of, of brothers and sisters. They were Moravian brothers. And they were singing hymns. And they were full of joy. And he looked at their faces. Their faces were shining. They weren't worried at all. He was just amazed and shocked. And so, anyway, at one point, it might not have been on this particular trip, maybe when he got back, but there was a Moravian brother that helped John Wesley quite much. Here's what he told him. He said, just preach justification by faith to others until you yourself are assured that you are justified by faith. I really like that. So John Wesley did that, and eventually that's what happened to him. And with the Wesleys, uh, a number of you know, there was a, a brother named George Whitfield, he began to hold open-air meetings where he would preach to thousands upon thousands of people in the open air. This was unheard of. The only uh, time that was sanctioned by the Coco Church was when you preached in, a, in, their, uh, in their building where they met. Well, George Whitfield went out of those conventional things he preached to large crowds in an open air, 
You can even read about this in the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. You know, George Whitfield came to Philadelphia one time, and Benjamin Franklin, of course, he was he, he could do so many things. He what he did one time, George Whitfield was preaching, and he started from where he was preaching. It was huge, massive crowd. And he started going back and back and back and back until he came to the point where he could not distinguish what George Whitfield was saying. And he calculated the distance. And he realized that, you know, how this man was able to speak to groups of 20,000 people, and this is without a microphone. I don't think any of us could do that today. Okay, so you have these brothers raised up. Then when you come to the 19th century, you have a group of people who were raised up in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, called, they were called the Brethren. Actually, they were, that was not their name. Uh, they, just, they just referred to one another as brothers. And so people on the outside, you know, they always want to give groups names and so they called them the Brethren. And so the Brethren were mainly, uh, the main one who took the lead among the Brethren was John Nelson Darby. And he was very much used by the Lord. He translated the Bible into French, um, into, into German and English. Um, he has a whole synopsis of, of the books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, which... Um, at least in his days, that if you wanted to know what the Bible spoke about, you needed to read that exposition. Now, also in the 19th century, you had a brother like Hudson Taylor who uh, sacrificed his everything, actually his life, to go to mainland China and preach the gospel. Not just to go to mainland China, but to go to the interior of mainland China. And that was a great, great thing. You also had a brother by the name of George Mueller. He was raised up in England, and of course, he had an orphanage, and he operated this orphanage purely by faith, purely by faith. And if you read his, um, his uh, autobiography or his journals, you can see some wonderful testimonies of how the Lord answered his prayers and how he purely lived by faith. Okay, then, um, you know, I would say the late 1800s, early 1900s, you have a, a sister by the name of Jessie Penn Lewis raised up, and she preached the truth of the cross. Then when you come to the 20th century, that's the century we just had, the 1900s, I think those of us who have been here for a while, uh, we can testify that when you read the works of of Watchman Nee. Firstly, let me stop with Watchman Nee. You know, Watchman Nee wrote, wrote a book called The Normal Christian Faith, The Normal Christian Life, and The Normal Christian Church Life. He used the word normal for all three of those, those um, expositions. The normal Christian faith, the normal Christian life, the normal Christian church life. That means that's what he was involved in is the recovery, which is a restoration or return to a normal condition, to what the normal condition of the church should be in faith, in the Christian life, and in the Christian church life. And of course, by the Lord's mercy, uh, he had a very close co-worker named Witness Lee. And um, anyway, you know, there's, there's a long story involved here, but I'm really going to take care of the time. And uh, I'm so thankful that the Lord sent Brother Lee to this country because when Brother Lee came to this country, he came with all the truths that the Lord had recovered through Watchman Nee, mainly in mainland China. And then when he came here, even further truths were, were recovered. And so here we are. I would say, brothers and sisters, we are very close to the Lord's coming. We are at the end of this age. And so when we talk about the demand of this age, which is God's need in this age, we are talking about the, the 
the last times, the end days. So look at A. A says, God's good pleasure. His heart's desire is to meet the demands of this age. I'm, I'm sorry, I already read, read, read this, which is God's need in this age. Now, A says, God's present need in this age is the body testimony. Now, you can read this. There's a, a book we have in the Collective Works of Watchman Nee called The Resumption of Watchman Nee's Ministry, where he points out that God's present need in this age is the body testimony. And what is the body testimony? Listen to this. It's the reality of the body of Christ consummating in the new Jerusalem as the bride of Christ. So we have this verse here, Matthew 16, 18, where the Lord himself says, I will build my, my church, not this one's church, not that one's church. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Well, we can consider this verse to be the greatest prophecy in the Bible. And when I use the word prophecy here, I use it in the term of foretelling the future. When the Lord said, I will build my church, this is what he has been doing little by little, gradually and gradually. Now, we are really in an intensified work of the Spirit in us, through us, and among us to build us up to be the body of Christ in reality and to prepare us to be his bride, to bring him back uh, so that the thousand-year kingdom can be ushered in, the millennial kingdom. So the greatest prophecy in the Bible, which is I will build my church, is being fulfilled through the present advance of the Lord's recovery. Now notice I have these verses from Ephesians 4, 1 through 16 on here. These actually, through the Apostle Paul, give us some details of how the Lord builds his church. Now you can, you can look at those later. Well, actually I'll refer uh, to a few of them in the next point. But I was so touched. You know, Brother Nee made this statement. Uh, he talked about the body testimony being God's final recovery. And he said this, what I'm about to share with you shows you the great, great capacity he had. He said, I've read the New Testament more than 200 times. He said, I've even read Revelation a few hundred times. And he said, he said, he just kind of said, I'm not worrying, worried about any passage uh, except one passage in, in the whole New Testament of being fulfilled. I'm, I'm concerned about one passage. Listen to what he says. I am worried about Ephesians 4. I am concerned about how this passage of the Scriptures will be fulfilled. But then he goes on to say, and I love this, he says, we believe that there will be a day when God's recovery will reach the fulfillment of Ephesians 4. The ultimate work among all the works, you know, in the Lord, since we can say since Luther's times, may very well be the recovery of the body testimony, which again is the reality of the body of Christ. God's leading today is to bring us back to the beginning and to be recovered to the condition of the beginning, which is the original condition of the church. Now, look at A. This brings us uh, to Ephesians 4. It says, again, I'm sorry, I read this. Uh, let's, let's come to B. B says, this brings us to Ephesians 4. B says, Ephesians 4, 15 and 16, say that all the members, I put that in bold print, all the members, not just one member, not just one prominent member, not just a spiritual giant, so-called, but all the members of the body grow up into the head and function out from the head. Thus, all the body with the supplying joints and the functioning of each one part causes the growth of the body unto the building up of itself in love. So, uh, this is, this is the Lord's present recovery. Now, now think about this. This is the recovery of the reality of the body of Christ. This is the great thing. 
These verses have never been touched uh, since the church entered into great degradation, since the time of Luther. You know, many servants of the Lord were used, and we are standing on their shoulders in this present day. And now, what the Lord wants to recover is He wants to recover you. He wants to recover me. He wants to recover all of us as the members of the body, to be functioning members of the body. And when we all function together, all of our functions cause all the body um, to grow unto the building up of itself in love. So C says this, in the present age, we are being perfected to become functioning members of the body of Christ. This is our being perfected unto the work of the ministry, unto the building up of the body of Christ. Saints, there has never been a time like this in church history. Right, I would say right now, I believe in this meeting uh, in the church in New York City and the churches there in New Jersey and elsewhere. We are daily being perfected to become functioning members of the body of Christ. And this perfecting, according to Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, is unto the work of the ministry. Now, what is the work of the ministry? It tells us what it is. This is an apposition, unto the building up of the body of Christ. So the work of the ministry, of the New Testament ministry, is the building up of the body of Christ. That is God's original intention that the Lord has brought us back to. When the body is built up, the bride will be prepared, the kingdom will be brought into full fruition, and the Lord will return to set up his sweet and beautiful kingdom on this earth, and we will enjoy him and reign with him as his co-kings for a thousand years. And that thousand years will be our wedding day. According to Peter's epistle, in the Lord's sight, a thousand years is like one day. And, uh, you know, when you get married, strictly speaking, your honeymoon lasts only one day. The rest of that time, you're not on your honeymoon, strictly speaking. You're, you're husband and wife. Um, well, we want to be there for our honeymoon. That will be our reward. That will be the reward of the kingdom. Now, uh, let's see. I just want to make sure that you're aware of some of these verses. You know, in A, we have like Revelation 19.7, 21.2, which tells us that the new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ, is the wife of the Lamb. The new Jerusalem is not a place we're going to. The new Jerusalem is what we are becoming. We are becoming the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ, the wife of the Lamb. And um, anyway, I'll, I'll just say that much for A, B, and C. Now let's come to Roman numeral two. Roman numeral two, um, to my impression, it is quite, quite marvelous. Listen to this. Roman numeral two says, God's good pleasure God's heart's desire is what makes God happy. Now, under this Roman numeral, there are 17 items of, listed of what makes God happy. Now, if you just look at A and B, for example, it says God is happy with this. B says God is happy with this. C says God is happy with this. So, Almost every point begins with God is happy with this. God is happy with that. God is happy with this. Well, we'll see, you know, why, why is he happy with these things? Why? God is very emotional. Uh, we'll see this just in a minute. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for this to share this with you. Now, listen to this. A says God is happy with the creation of the earth. His kingdom will be set up on the earth. You know, in Job 38, when the Lord finally spoke to Job, he said, he said to Job, when were, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Then he says this, 
when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, these morning stars and these sons of God are the, are the angels in this context. They're the angels. When the, when the earth was created, the angels sang together. The angels shouted for joy. Now, if they sang together and they shouted for joy, doesn't that indicate that God was happy also? They're not going to sing uh, together and shout for joy if God's not full of joy. So we can see that God is happy uh, with the creation of the earth. Now, when we come to the book of Revelation, we can see this because it says eventually in Revelation 5.10 that God will eventually make us a kingdom and priest our God, and it says, and they will reign on the earth. So there has to be, there, the earth has to be there for the Lord's overcomers to reign on. In Revelation eleven fifteen, 15, um, this verse says this, and this is great news. It says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. In other words, you have to have the creation of the earth so that the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, we can be in that kingdom, we can be co-kings with the Lord in that kingdom, and we can reign on the earth or we can reign over the earth, not just for a thousand, for a thousand years we want to be in that millennial kingdom, but also forever and ever. Saints, no matter how you feel right now, I, I, you know, I can't see you, so I don't know how you feel personally, but I want you to, <laughs> to be full of joy because this book is, we can say this book is the autobiography of the triune God, and we can also say that this autobiography has become our biography. Now, why do I say this? Because I know, I know your ending. I know when I look at the end of this book, I know what your ending is. One part of your ending is that you're going to be married to Christ forever and ever. Not only that, according to this verse. Okay, this verse says Christ will reign forever and ever. If you go to Revelation 22. It says we will reign forever and ever because we will be his co-kings. So no matter how, what ups and downs we go through, eventually our ending is glorious. We are going to be his wife in a, in a marriage union with him where we are united with him in life. We are mingled with him in nature and we are incorporated together with him. He, we, we are his home. He is our home. We're dwelling in him. He's dwelling in us. We are incorporated with him to be what I would call a great God-man, where man dwells in God and God dwells in man forever and ever. That is our ending. Okay, now let's come to B. B says God is happy with the creation of man. For each of the items that God had created, he said good. You know, everything that God created, if you look in Genesis 1, it says God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good. This is repeated over and over. Now, for God to say something is good it is way higher a standard than when we say it's good. But Genesis 1 ends in this way. In Genesis 1:26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heaven, the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Now listen to how verse 31 ends Genesis 1. It says, God saw everything that he made and indeed it was very good. Not just good, but very good. Why was it very good? It was very good in God's eyes because 
God had come to the pinnacle of his creation, which was a man in his image, uh, representing him, you know, who could represent him with his dominion. So for man to be created in God's image means that we were created to be, to be filled with God to such an extent that we become God's corporate expression. And we were created to exercise to dominion so that we could be filled with the divine life to such an extent that we reign in life, uh, according to Romans 5, 17. We reign in the divine life, and uh, we represent God with his dominion as his co-kings. And that is God's eternal purpose. Now, saints, I have Isaiah 43, verse 7 here. I hope you won't forget this verse. I'm always very touched with this verse because this verse says, it says God created us, formed us, and made us for his glory. Saints, we, we okay, personally, you were created. You were formed, and you were made for God's glory. And corporately, we were made for God's glory. What is glory? Again, we can say personally, glory is the radiant expression of God. Corporately, glory is the corporate expression of God. So if you look in Romans 9, verses 21 and 23, it tells us that God created us as vessels. What are vessels? Vessels are um, a vessel is something used to contain something. Well, we are vessels to contain God. That's what we were made for. We were made to contain God. And when we are filled with God, to overflowing, according to Romans 9, 21 and 23, we become vessels of mercy unto honor and unto glory which means that we are filled with the God of mercy to overflowing, and this is unto results in honoring God and results in glory to God, meaning that we're filled with him to such an extent that we become the corporate expression of God. This is quite marvelous. Now, let's go come to C. C says God is happy with the incarnation. And we've got some verses here that we'll, I'll read in a little bit. Now, these next verses refer to Isaiah 9, and um, this says this, God is happy with the incarnation. Jesus is the wonderful counselor. Some translations say, according to Isaiah 9, 6, that he is wonderful, just wonderful. You know, he's altogether a wonder. Uh, the word wonderful here in Hebrew means incomprehensible. He's inexplicable. He's just something beyond uh, quantifiable human understanding. This is why we always need revelation uh, whenever we're reading the Bible or the ministry and a spirit and atmosphere of prayer. In a meeting like this, we're not here for mere information. What we need is revelation. Revelation is what changes our life. So Jesus is the wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the eternal father. And he's the prince of peace to be the unique governor. And the government of the triune God is upon his shoulder. Saints, what that means is that all the responsibilities that we might take upon our shoulders, when we do that, it causes us anxiety. It causes us to be weighed down. We need to realize those, those should not be on our shoulder. They are on his shoulder. The government is, is upon his shoulder. Uh, the responsibility for the kingdom, for the church life, for everything that we do in our Christian life, we have to realize it, it should be upon his shoulder, not upon our shoulder. And let's go on here. He is our Savior and our Emmanuel, the God-man the one who is united, mingled, and incorporated with God. And we spoke about this, that uh, this also 
can refer to us because there are three words that describe our relationship with God that also describe the Lord Jesus' relationship with the Father. Number one is union. That's union in the divine life. Number two is mingling. That's the mingling of the divine and human nature. The third aspect of our relationship with God is incorporation. That is the mutual indwelling of persons, where God dwells in man and man dwells in God to produce a God-man. This is just, to me, absolutely marvelous. And that's why, saints, God's heart's desire, I just give this as a, you know, we're, we're going in this direction, but this shows, incarnation shows that God's heart's desire is to have a God-man. God does not want to have a good man. He wants to have a God-man. Now, of course, a God-man is a good man, but when we, when, we, when we say that, what we mean is what the Lord Jesus said in the Gospels when someone said to him, called him good teacher, and he said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Saints, uh, you know, as we go on in our Christian life and in our church life, the Lord is doing a remodeling and restructuring work in us. To remodel us, he's using the environment to tear down every aspect of our natural being so he can restructure us and rebuild us with all that he is in his divine trinity as, according to 1 Corinthians 3.12, as precious materials, which are gold, silver, and precious stones, which signifies the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, we are being rebuilt with the, with the riches of the divine trinity for his corporate expression. And at the same time, our natural being is being torn down by the environment. Even our natural goodness is, is torn down so that God himself becomes our goodness, so that we come to the realization that we're not, actually, we're not good at all. Uh, you know, Isaiah tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags in God's sight. But uh, even if you think, oh, I'm a good person, well, that's your natural goodness. God wants to be your goodness. Actually, again, what God wants is not a good natural man, but a God man. He wants you to be filled with God. Saints, our journey into God has not been completed yet. Every day, we want to gain more of God, and we want God to gain more of us. You know, when Paul said, I pursue toward the goal, for the prize in Philippians 3.14, the goal there is the fullest enjoyment and the fullest gaining of Christ. Saints, always remember this when you wake up in the morning. You need to realize, Lord, by your mercy, as the spirit of reality, guide me into the reality of fully enjoying you today and of fully gaining you today as much as possible. Okay, now um, we come back to this point that, uh, you know, God was, of course, he was full of joy and he was full of happiness. It made him so, so happy when he became a man. He was happy with the incarnation. Now, what indicates this? If you look at Luke 2, 9 through 14, the Lord appeared to some shepherds. These shepherds were very, very fortunate that the Lord would make, make a special appearance to them. Actually, he did it through an angel of the Lord. This is Luke 2, 9 through 14. It says, an angel of the Lord stood by them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And it says these shepherds, they feared greatly. But listen to what the angel said to them. I like this. He said, do not be afraid, for behold, I announce to you good news of great joy. Saints, uh, I think those of us who love the Lord, 
without getting into situation, we can all we all realize that mostly in the world they're just bad news. But in this meeting, this meeting is full of good news. And saints, this Bible is the good news. This is the good news. And so um, the angel said, I announce to you good news of what? Of great joy, which will be for all the people. Because today, a Savior has been born to you in David's city, which is Bethlehem, who is Christ the Lord. You know, Christ was, Christ was the Lord in eternity past. But now he became a man. So now the Lord is not just the Lord in his divinity. He, he is the Lord and now he has humanity. He is the Lord Jesus. Jesus is a man. He is now the Lord Jesus. So it says, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly army praising God and saying, glory in the highest places to God and on earth, peace among men of his good pleasure. Again, these words good pleasure are mentioned there, which is what makes God happy. Now, again, you know, I, I essentially um, read to you Isaiah 9, 6, uh, 6 through 7. You know, in Isaiah 7, 14, it says that there will be a child that will be born, Isaiah 7, 14. It says his name will be called Emmanuel. And Matthew 1, 23 tells us that Jesus, his name, the name that will be, that this Savior, the name that men will call him will be by the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. Isn't that wonderful? Firstly, God is with our spirit. 2 Timothy 4.22 says, The Lord be with your spirit. Not only that, God is with us in our gatherings. In Matthew 18 and 18 verse 20, he says, Where two or three are gathered together into my name, there I am in their midst. So God is with us right now in this gathering as Emmanuel. And in the, at the very end of the book of Matthew, he charges us to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the whole inhabited earth. And he says this, and behold, I will be with you until the consummation of the age. So we need to go and disciple the nations to be the kingdom people. As we're doing that, we have the consciousness that he is with us in our whole being. That means we have his presence. He is not doctrinal to us. We have his actual person, his actual presence uh, with us. Now, saints, what's very amazing to me is right after Isaiah 7, 14, where it talks about the virgin will conceive and bear a son. His name will be called Emmanuel. The next verse, verse 15 says, our translation, the recovery version of the Bible, it says he will eat curds and honey all the days of his life that he might know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Well, other translations like Darby as one translation, which of course is a very excellent translation, and uh, the Chinese Union version, which is in like 1901, something like that, excellent translation of the Bible, Instead of the word curds, they use the word butter. Now, you know, curds is, the, is a, a very accurate translation of the Hebrew word, but you could also translate it as butter. The curds, when, when a cow produces milk, the top part of the milk is the curds. That's the richest part. And we know butter is very rich. So, so, um, if we use this translation of butter, we can say that Jesus, who is the God-man, who is God with us, uh, that's predicted in Isaiah 7, 14. In verse 15, what you have is a description of his human living. 
verse 15 says, he will eat butter and honey all the days of his life, that he might know how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Now, let me just say this. What does the good signify there? If you look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, uh, I believe it's verse 2, it speaks of the good, well-pleasing, and perfect will of God. To refuse the evil and choose the good is to choose God's will. It's the good will of God. You know, sometimes when we choose God's will, it's not a very easy thing to do. God might want us to do something, to go somewhere, to say something to someone that goes against our natural being. Well, what is the power to choose to do God's will? Saints, I encourage you to read this there in the Collect the Works of Watchman Nee. There is a message or an article in there called The Power of Choosing. The Power of Choosing. And it talks about Isaiah 15. Watchman Nee talks about this here. What is the power of choosing? The power of choosing for the Lord Jesus. You know, the, the Lord had to choose to die on the cross. He had to choose many things. How did he choose God's perfect will all the time? He did this by two things, butter and honey. He ate butter and honey his whole, during his whole human living. Now, before I give you the, the spiritual significance of this, I would just like to point this out, that in the spiritual, divine, and mystical realm, when you eat spiritual food, you do not need to worry about cholesterol. We know that butter is very rich, right? And maybe heightens your cholesterol in the physical realm. But in the divine realm, what do these two items refer to? Butter signifies the richest grace. Honey signifies the sweetest love. So because the Lord Jesus enjoyed the richest grace of God the Father, and because he was continually in fellowship with God the Father, enjoying the sweetest love of God the Father, that gave him the power to choose God's good will every time, good, well-pleasing, and perfect will of God. In the same way, saints, every day, we need to enjoy the Lord as our heavenly butter. He needs to be the richest grace to us every day. We need to enjoy him as the heavenly honey every day. He needs to be the sweetest love to us every day. Um, this is why, saints, give yourself to enjoy the Lord every day. Even to pray a simple prayer in the morning. Lord Jesus, I consecrate myself to enjoy you today. To enjoy you today. As butter, the richest grace, and as honey, the sweetest love. Of course, there's many ways to do this. You know, if you look at Psalm 119, uh, one verse there says, your words were sweeter than honey to, to my taste. So the words, when we really pray over God's words and pray them back to the Lord, those words become like honey to us. They become the sweetest love of God to us. Okay, now uh, let's go to D. D says, God is happy with Christ's baptism. You, you know, when I um, first received the Lord, and that's quite a story, I won't get into that, but soon after I received the Lord, I would say shortly after I received the Lord, maybe the most three weeks, I began to experience the Lord's presence. And the Lord began to be real to me, which was really shocking to me. Um, he, he was very merciful to me, he appeared to me, he became real to me. And so um, some of my Christian brothers, after I got saved, they would say, Ed, you need to be baptized. And initially I would say to them, I'd say, look, I don't need to be baptized. I, I know the Lord, the Lord's real to me. I love the Lord. And finally, one of the brothers said this, Ed, listen, listen, listen closely to me. Even Jesus was baptized. I said, I'm getting baptized. <laughs> If Jesus got baptized, how could I not be baptized? Of course, I did not know the significance of Jesus' baptism at that point. 
So let's go on and read this. This said, it says that when Christ was baptized, he, be, he to begin his public ministry, the heavens were open to him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens saying, this is my son, the beloved, in whom I have found my delight. Saints, when we, when we allow ourselves to be baptized, we are baptized according to the New Testament. We are baptized uh, into Christ, into the death of Christ, uh, into the body of Christ, and into the triune God. And when you're baptized into the death of Christ, according to Romans 6, when you're raised up from that baptismal water, which signifies death, you are raised up, that signifies resurrection, where you walk in newness of life. You become a new creation. You walk in newness of life. And so God is happy with this. This, this is his delight. And let's go on. It says, the Lord Jesus, taking the standing of a typical man, was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Now, you remember when he, was, when he came to be baptized by John, John recognized who he was. And he told the Lord, he said, I have need to be baptized by you. And the Lord said, let's permit it for now for me to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Well, what does that mean? Righteousness there means to be right with God by living and doing the things that God has ordained. Well, well, Jesus as a man wanted to do what God the Father had ordained at that time. God had ordained for people to be baptized in, by John the baptism, which was a baptism of repentance. And to be baptized, let me go on, was to allow himself to be put into death and resurrection so that he might live and minister in, in resurrection. So again, um, there's a lot of significance to this, but it shows that God was so happy with Christ's baptism because Christ, as a man, he fulfilled all of God's righteousness. He fulfilled what God ordained on the earth at that time, and it spoke to the whole universe that, that as a typical man, he was put into death so that all of his living and all of his ministry would be in resurrection. Now, let's come to E. E says God is happy with the resurrected and glorified Christ. When Christ was transfigured, this is in Matthew 17. You remember he took uh, Peter, James, and John with him to the mount, which was probably Mount Hermon. If you read the footnote in Matthew 17, which people call this the Mount of Transfiguration, he was transfigured before them. Uh, he, he just shone uh, like, like the brightness of the sun almost. He was just shining. And... Um, he was speaking with, with, with Moses and, and, um, and, and with Elijah. And, and the disciples were so frightened. And Peter, you know, Peter made a lot of mistakes. And because he did that, he's always an encouragement to me because even though he made those mistakes, he stayed with the Lord. He said, Lord, let's make three tents or tabernacles here for you and, and, and Moses and Elijah. And all of a sudden, a cloud overshadowed them. And a voice out of the cloud says, This is my son, the beloved, in whom I have found my delight. Hear him. In other words, you don't need to hear the law represented by Moses anymore. You don't need to hear the prophets represented by Elijah anymore. You need to hear him. You need to hear my son because he is the real Moses. He is the real Elijah. He is the reality of all that Moses stood for. He is the reality of all that Elijah stood for. So it says, God took pleasure in the resurrection and glorification of his son. Saints, we have a hymn in our hymnal 
which is number 608. It says, the triune God has now become our all. How wonderful, how glorious. Stanza 4 says this, the Spirit is the Son's transfiguration. Come into us as life, the full supply. So the transfiguration of the Son is the life-giving Spirit. 1 Corinthians 15, 45b says, Christ as the last Adam in resurrection, he became a life-giving Spirit. That life-giving Spirit is his transfigured state, and that transfigured state of the Lord Jesus as the life-giving Spirit is in our spirit. That is really uh, quite marvelous. Now, let's come to F. God is happy when his prodigal sons return to him. Now, of course, we know that Luke 15 speaks of, of someone or of ones who are saved initially by the Lord. But it also refers to God's children, believers, who have backslidden, who have turned away from the Lord, who maybe were once zealous for the Lord, but they're not as zealous as they used to be. Well, we know that this prodigal son, that what happened to him, he wanted to leave his father's house. He asked the father, Give me the portion of my inheritance that belongs to me. So he went into a distant country. He spent all of that money on, you know, on debauchery, on terrible things. And after he had spent everything, a great famine came into the land. And he found himself uh, working at a job in which he had to feed pigs. Not only did he feed the pigs, he ate what the pigs ate. Now, we know that, uh, you know, in Judaism, among Orthodox Jews, you know, pork is, is like a, a anathema. It's like he, pigs are just unclean animals to the uttermost. And so we are, here he is uh, not just tending unclean pigs, he's eating their very food. Finally, if you read Luke 15, it says he it uses these words. He came to himself. He came to himself. You know, this happened. I remember this happened to me when I was an unbeliever. I came to myself. I said, what am I doing? Is this my destiny? What I'm doing now? Is this what the meaning of my life is? Or as a Christian, if you get if you become backslidden or you um I, I don't know, a lot of things can happen. You, you can enter into a backslidden state. Then the saints are praying for you, and, and you, uh, you come to your senses. You come to yourself, and you say, what's happened to me? I need to come back to the church life. I was full of joy when I was in the meeting. Now I'm just, I'm just miserable. And so um, anyway, let me go on here. It says the parable of the prodigal son in Luke 15, may be called the parable of a happy father. Now, I hope you would, your concept would change, and you would call this the parable of a happy father. Why do we say this? Well, when the son was returning to the father, the father saw him a long way off. And by reading this, it infers that the father was looking for his son to return every day. No doubt, the father was praying for his son to return. He saw him a long way off, and it, it says the father ran to his returning son. That, that's the literal word there, ran. It's the only time in the Bible where it alludes to the fact that God the father ran. Saints, when we return to our father God, he will run to meet us. So he ran to his son. His son had this speech. Uh, he was going to say, Father, I'm not worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He had this speech worked up. The father interrupted him. He interrupted his speech, and he told his servants, bring out the best robe. What does the best robe signify? It signifies Christ as the God-satisfying righteousness to cover 
the penitent sinner. Then he said, put a ring on his finger. That signifies the sealing spirit. Put sandals on his feet. That signifies the power of God's salvation to separate us from this dirty world. But then, of course, the prodigal son was very hungry. Outwardly, he was now prepared to enter into the father's house, which you can say signifies the church. The church is the house of the living God. Well, the father told his servants, bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And he said, let us eat and be merry. The fattened calf signifies the rich Christ killed on the cross for our enjoyment. Isn't that wonderful? He was killed on the cross so that he could enter into resurrection and become our spiritual food for our enjoyment. So saints, in the church life, let me just make this statement. In the church life, let us eat and be merry. I want to say in this meeting, let us eat Christ and enjoy Christ, which is to be merry. Now, look at how the end phrase says, here we see the merriment of God, the merriment of God. This is the parable of a happy father. Now, let's come to G. This has a certain progression to it. He returned to the father. This takes place also. God is happy when his son is revealed in us. It pleased God. When we say it pleased God, that means it made God happy. It makes God happy. It pleased God to reveal his son in me. This is what Paul said about his conversion experience in Acts 9. He said, it pleased God who set me apart from my mother's womb. That's before I was born. And called me through his grace. That's after he was born to reveal, I love these words, his son in me. His son in me. Listen, when we are fully brought into the sonship of God, when we are fully brought into the sonship of God. Uh, you know, Galatians 4, 4 through 6 says, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law. Then it says, God sent forth the spirit of his son. And because we have the spirit of his son in our spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. Our God is now our Father because the Spirit of His Son is in our spirit, which means we have the Father's life. Uh, so this makes God happy. So let me read on after the semicolon. This says, this fulfills God's good pleasure to have many sons for His corporate expression. The Son revealed in us has brought us into the meaning of the earth of man, and of the incarnated, crucified, and resurrected Lord. Now, we just spoke about God was happy with the earth. He was happy with the creation of man. He was happy with his incarnation. He was happy with his crucifixion, his resurrection, as signified by baptism. And he is happy when his son is revealed in us. Now, let's go on to H. God is happy to operate in us, both the willing and the working, for what? For his good pleasure, which is what makes him happy. This is Philippians 2.13. Uh, if you feel that, sometimes we feel, well, we're just not willing to go along with God. Well, we can pray this verse back to God. We could say, oh, dear Lord Jesus, dear triune God, operate in me the willing for your good pleasure. I want your will to be dispensed into my will so that I am willing to go along with you and to cooperate with you to bring in what makes you happy, what brings into being your good pleasure. Okay, now let's go on. The Christian life with the supply of the body is a happy life. Okay, I'll just stop there. We're talking about what makes God happy. But when we are in the realm and our primary uh, thing is to, is, to, is to carry out God's heart desire, is to carry out what makes God happy, then we begin 
for the first time to live a happy life. You know, it always was so strange to me that before I was regenerated, before I um, got saved by the Lord initially, um, I, you, could, you could have said I was a popular person, but I was miserable. But then when I got saved and regenerated, I became happy. And when I became happy, I started to become unpopular. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. Uh, it just showed that the enemy, God's enemy, Satan, he does not, he's not, he is not happy when Christ comes into a person. But when Christ comes into us and we enjoy him as our life supply, which is the supply of the body, our life becomes a happy life. You know, whenever I minister the word, I have to confess, you know, when you minister the word, you look around in the audience, you could, you could, you can discern where people are. A lot of people are smiling. You could tell they're full of joy. Uh, some people, they're just, oh my goodness, they look so unhappy. And I'm so concerned when I when I see that. Because I realize they're not enjoying the Lord. Well, let me go on. Our inward joy, not our joy. You know, you can have a lot of outward possessions. You, you can even, you know, people like to go on vacations. They go on a vacation, they come back, and they need a vacation from their vacation. They're wiped out. Saints, I'm not saying we don't need to go away to rest. Of course we do. But we have to realize that our real rest is inward. Our real joy is inward. So our inward joy is an indication that we are living and walking according to God's good pleasure. Since the book of Philippians, written by Paul in prison, is concerned with the experience and enjoyment of Christ, which issue in joy, it is a book filled with joy and rejoicing. Saints, it is so, um, how do I say it? Um, you know, what is this? Here's a person who's in prison and he is writing to the Philippians and talking to them about rejoicing in the Lord. And he is a person full of joy regardless of his outward circumstances. So all these verses show this. Um, you know, Paul talks about rejoicing here. He talks about him being a channel uh, to, so that Christ could flow out through him into the saints for their joy of the faith. That's Philippians 1.25. The joy of the faith there is the enjoyment of Christ. Uh, then in, in uh, I'll just skip down here. In Philippians 3.1, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. He's saying this from prison. Rejoice in the Lord. He says, to write the same things to you, for me, it is not irksome, but for you, it is safe. In other words, Paul was telling the Philippians, it's safe, it's not irksome for me to repeat this to you. It's safe for me to tell you to rejoice in the Lord. You need to be reminded of this every day. Um, so in Philippians 4, 4, Paul charges them again. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, if I were writing that, I would have put a period there and a discussion. Paul didn't do that. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Saints, uh, what this indicates is that the content of the church life depends on the enjoyment of Christ. So when we love the Lord, we enjoy the Lord, and our enjoyment of the Lord becomes the content of the church life. We have to remember that. Now, let's come to I. I says, God is happy to have a man of God who lives God and lives out God in order to gain God by being one with God. You know, saints, you know, I say this a lot, but at the end of our brother's ministry, he said this a lot, and that is pray short prayers over these points. You can pray, Lord Jesus, make me a real 
man of God in your sight. Make me a man who lives God and who lives out God. And make me a man who gains God by being one with God in a day-by-day -day way. The Lord will, you know, he'll be emotional to hear a prayer like this. This kind of prayer will make him happy because this is what makes him happy. Now, let's, let's come after the semicolon. Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is the standard pattern of a man of God who lived out God. All these verses in John show us this. The Lord said that he did not come to do his own will or to seek his own glory. When we take Christ as our crucified life, for his manifestation as the resurrection life, we will, we will experience him as the indwelling and enabling power of resurrection to deny our will and our glory. So if you look at all these verses, you know, Psalm 90, Deuteronomy 33, Ezra 3, all use this term, Moses, the man of God. That's a marvelous title. You know, in 2 Timothy 3 and 1 Timothy 6, it says, all scripture is God breathed that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. What does this verse describe? It describes a man of God with the breath of God. That means whenever we get into this holy word, we need to receive this word by means of all prayer and petition. And since this very word has been breathed out by God and is God's breath, when we take this word by means of all prayer, we are breathing in God. We are inhaling God. And then what we inhale of God through prayer, we minister to others. That is our exhaling of God into others. That's why in Acts 6, 4, the apostle says, we want to continue steadfastly. We want to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Prayer is the inhaling of God. The ministry of the word is the exhaling of God. To inhale, of, inhale God, we have to come to the God-breathed scriptures. These scriptures are the breathing out of God. 1 Timothy 6, Paul tells Timothy, he says, Oh, man of God. I love this. Just that, that terminology, oh, man of God. Now, uh, the Lord Jesus, as the standard pattern of a God-man, he, he says this, as the living Father has sent me, this is John 6, 57, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also shall live because of me. Now, we can say that we need to live by Christ, but the but the most exact translation of John 6, 57 is that the Lord Jesus lived, he lived because of the Father, and he wanted us to eat him as our spiritual food. You know, his words are spirit and life. So when we take his words by means of all prayer and petition and pray them back to the Lord, uh, these words become our spiritual food. And so this is the way we eat the Lord. He said, he said in Matthew 4, 4, he said, uh, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out through the mouth of God. So his word is our spiritual food. Now, now let me go on to the point here. He says, he who eats me as his spiritual food shall live because of me. Now, if we, if we say to live by Christ, strictly speaking, you know, to, to use some, to, if I walk, uh, if I use an instrument for walking, such as a cane, um, I am living or walking by that cane. But for me to live because of something means that to live because of Christ means that Christ is the factor of our living. What this means is that the food that we eat, we live because of the food. We live because that food 
is a supplying factor so that we can live because of its supply. So Christ is the factor and element of our supply so that we can live Christ for his magnification. Okay, um, now this brings us to J, which actually I shared mostly. God is happy when we eat Christ as our spiritual food in order to live because of him. To eat Christ is to eat his words by exercising our spirit to both pray, read, and muse upon his words so that his words become the gladness and joy of our heart. Now, saints, to muse upon God's words, uh, in Psalm 119, verse 15, we have a footnote in our recovery version that is marvelous that tells us what the Hebrew word for muse means. I encourage you to read that prayerfully. Now, according to Jeremiah 15, when we eat God's words, his words should become the gladness and joy of our heart. Uh, what? How much gla inner gladness do you have right now? How much inner joy do you have right now? It's all dependent on how much you have actually eaten God's words. Okay, let me go on after the semicolon, to live because of Christ <coughs> means that the energizing element of Christ becomes the supplying factor for us to live Christ. Now we'll come to the next point. K says, God is happy when we are daily strengthened into our inner man so that Christ may make his home in our hearts through faith. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our inner man is our regenerated spirit, which has God's life as its life. So, saints, <clears throat> this makes God happy when we're strengthened into our inner man. And so this is why I would exhort you to build up a habit I'm praying Ephesians 3, 16 and 17. Tell the Father, say, Father, according to the riches of your glory, strengthen me with power through your spirit into the inner man so that Christ can make his home in my heart through faith. That means Christ can move out from my spirit into all the parts of my heart, my conscience, mind, emotion, and will and settle down in my heart to make my heart his home. That makes him happy. Now, L says, God is happy when we remain in our spirit and pay attention to our spirit. You know, uh, Romans 8, 6b says, the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind to be set on the spirit means that we pay attention to our spirit. And so uh, God is happy when we remain in our spirit. So when the Lord says, abide in me, isn't that wonderful? Abide in me. That means, that means yes, I do live in you, but I want you to stay and you, and you are in me. You know, we're in Christ right now. That's the fact. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says that it is of God that we are in Christ Jesus. God put us into Christ, and God put Christ into us. But the Lord goes on in John 15, 4, yes, you are in me, but I want you to abide in me. I want you, That means I want you to continue in me. I want you to stay in me. If you do this, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. And then... Uh, this point says, when the Lord says, abide in me, this wonderful me is in our spirit. So to abide in me, this me is in our spirit, means that we have to abide in our spirit. Listen to this. When we are in him, by being in our spirit, in us, the ruler of the world has nothing. Now, let me just pause there. 
You know, in John 14, 30, the Lord said this. He said, the ruler of this world is coming. That's Satan. And he said this, in me, he has nothing. In me. There was only one man in world history that could say that. In me, Satan has nothing. That means he has no ground, he has no chance, he has no hope, and he has no possibility in anything in me or related to me. Now we have to realize this me in whom Satan has nothing is now in our spirit. So look at this point when we are in him by being in our spirit, in us the ruler of the world has nothing. That means he has no ground, no chance, no hope, and no possibility in anything. So saints, again, just even to pray a simple prayer, Lord, keep me in my spirit. Preserve me in my spirit. That is to abide in the Lord. Keep me, keep me abiding in you. Keep me in my spirit, Lord, because when we're in our spirit, we are in him because he's in our spirit. Um, saints, I can never forget, I was going through a period of physical suffering that was, that was really bad one time, and I didn't understand what was going on. And But eventually, by the Lord's mercy, whether I understood or not, I realized that I'm not going to gain God in this. I don't want to go through this and not gain Christ and not gain God. So I had one prayer in the middle of my in the middle of all this pain, and I prayed it repeatedly. I said, Lord, no matter how bad I feel, keep me in my spirit, Lord. Keep me in my spirit. I I, I could never forget that. Saints, again. When the Lord says, abide in me, this wonderful me is in our spirit. And when we are in him, by being in our spirit, the ruler of this world, Satan, has nothing. He has no ground in us. He has no chance in us. He has no hope in us. And he has no, no possibility in us in anything. And let's come to M. M says, God is happy when we serve him as a slave by living in the reality of the kingdom of God in the way of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. This is well-pleasing to God and approved by men. You know, we always concentrate on verse 17. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. But verse 18 that follows it is very significant. It says, he who serves Christ in this, in what? In this, in, in taking Christ as your righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. That is to serve Christ. That is not just for your living. That is your serving. When you live in the reality of the kingdom, when you take Christ as your righteousness in the Holy Spirit, when he becomes your peace in the Holy Spirit, when he becomes your joy in the Holy Spirit, that is your service to him. So it says, he who serves Christ in this is well-pleasing to God. That means you make God happy. And you are approved by men. So, saints, you want to make God happy? Again, um, live in the reality of the kingdom by enjoying Christ as righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Now, let's come to end. And says, God is happy when we worship him in spirit. God's eternal economy is focused on and is carried out by our mingled spirit. This mingled spirit is the divine spirit mingled together with our human spirit as one spirit. So Romans 8, 16 says the spirit with our spirit. And 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says he was joined to the Lord is one spirit. So the divine spirit is mingled with our human spirit to become one mingled spirit, one mingled spirit. So uh, God wants us to worship him in spirit. Saints, John 4, 23 and 24 are marvelous verses. Listen to what verse 23 says. Many times we just skip over to verse 24, but verse 23 says that uh, 
uh, okay, I'll just say this much. It says the father is seeking. The father is actually seeking. Now, the father is seeking certain kind of people. That's a great thing. I want to be the kind of person that the father is seeking. What kind of person is that? A true worshiper. The father is seeking true worshipers. That's all of us. How can we be his true worshipers? His true worshipers are those who worship him in spirit and in truthfulness. To worship him in spirit is to worship him in our mingled spirit by exercising our spirit to contact him. And in truthfulness means that we take Christ as our divine reality. And his divine, this divine reality becomes our genuineness and sincerity for the true worship of God worship of God. But what I'm emphasizing here is that God is happy when we worship him in our spirit. Uh, his eternal economy is focused on and is carried out by our mingled spirit. Now, let's come to O. O says God is happy when we are one with him in his ministry to carry out his eternal economy. In the Lord's ministry, we care only, and I would say in this meeting, we care only for the divine dispensing of the triune God embodied in Christ and realized as the Spirit into his chosen people. Brothers and sisters, I can say this with my whole heart. All I care for in this meeting is that God in Christ as the Spirit is dispensing himself into you right now. That is what the New Testament ministry is all about. When we wake up in the morning, we need to have an aspiration, a prayer. Lord, dispense yourself into my entire being all day long today and flow out of me to dispense yourself into others. Okay, all these verses refer to this. Um, these verses talk about God's economy. Um, they talk about you know, Paul's ministry, which was to minister, dispense the spirit of the living God into others, which was to dispense uh, the reality of Christ into others. And these verses also, 1 Peter 4.10, tells us that we need to minister, we need to be good stewards of the very grace of God. You know, in Ephesians 3.2, Paul said the stewardship of the grace of God was given to me for you. Now, what is the grace of God? Grace is God in Christ as the Spirit for our enjoyment. And this enjoyment is given to me for you. What's my motivation for enjoying the Lord? My, vote, my motivation for enjoying the Lord is, is you, my brothers and sisters. I have to enjoy the Lord for your sake. You have to enjoy the Lord for my sake. If you're caring for the young people, you have to enjoy the Lord for them. Your enjoyment, the enjoyment of God is to you for them. Well, how can you help anyone if you don't enjoy the Lord? So again, it's the stewardship of the grace of God to me for you. We enjoy the Lord for others. The totality of our service is embodied in these words, to me for you. If there's no to me, there's no for you. So our day should begin with, with the divine dispensing of the triune God into our being for our enjoyment. That is to me. And then that enjoyment overflows from within us. And we cooperate with him to dispense him into others that is for them. And 1 Peter 4.10 says, if we do this, we are good stewards of the very grace of God. It's, it's interesting, the Greek word economy is oikonomia. The Greek word for stewards here in 1 Peter 4.10 is oikonomos, an economist. You have God's economy, you have God's economists, but it's different, that's the monetary realm. To be someone who carries out God's economy is to be someone who enjoys the unsearchable riches 
of Christ as the life-giving sevenfold intensified spirit of grace, which is to me in many aspects so that I can be one with him to dispense himself into others for their enjoyment. Okay, finally, we, uh, we come to the last two points. P says, we must be a people in whom, with whom, and through whom God may have his good pleasure. We must be determined to gain the honor of being well-pleasing to him. Again, well-pleasing. Well that means what pleases him. That means we want to gain the honor of being persons who make him happy, of being well-pleasing to him by being one with Christ as the one who sacrificed himself on the cross to produce new wine to cheer God and man. Now, um, we know in the New Testament, in Matthew 9, 17, uh, the Lord speaks of new wine. Christ is the reality of the new wine. Well, in Judges 9, 12, and 13, there's a parable here. And, and I won't get into the whole context, but it says, the tree said to the vine, come and reign over us, rule over us. But the vine said to the other trees, shall I leave my new wine, which cheers God and men, and go to wave over the other trees? Now, what does it mean to wave over the other trees? It means you have some hierarchical position. Um, you like to lord it over others. If you're that kind of person, you lose your life-dispensing uh, function. You lose the enjoyment of Christ. The enjoyment of Christ is the new wine. So the, so the vine says, I'm not going to leave my new wine, which cheers God and men, to have a hierarchical position over any brother or sister, to lord it over anyone, to tell anyone what to do or what not to do. I'm not going to leave my new wine. My new wine, which is Christ himself, it makes God happy and it makes man happy. Now, what does the new wine refer to? Well, listen to this verse in Song of Songs chapter 1. Uh, within the first four verses, the seeker says, your love is better than wine. That is true. So the new wine signifies the love of Christ. What is more enjoyable than that? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, which we mentioned 2 Corinthians 5, 9, verses 14 and 15, Paul says, the love of Christ constrains us so that we would no longer live to, our, to ourselves, but to him who died for us and has been raised. We want the love of Christ to constrain us. We want the love of Christ to fill us. And then that love becomes our new wine. And we love God with God as our love. We love one another with God as our love, with the new wine. Not only that, of course, uh, you know, different parts of the ministry in the note points out that the new wine signifies the invigorating, exciting life of Christ, which, which of course is true. There's another verse at the end of Psalm 16, verse 11. This, this psalm actually speaks about the human living of Christ, but in our identification of Christ, with Christ, and our oneness with Christ, it should be the same. This verse says this, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Saints, when we are in God's presence, we are full of joy. Nothing can match God's presence. Um, his presence means everything to us. Uh, and simply put, God's presence is God's smile. When you have God's smile in you, you have his presence. When you have his smile in you, that means you are doing what makes him happy. And because you are carrying out what makes him happy, in his presence, in your spirit, is fullness of joy. It becomes your fullness of joy. Now, let's come to Q. God will be happy with our glorification. Now, this is the ultimate consummation 
of God's complete salvation. This is the ultimate consummation of God's good pleasure, where uh, he takes us all the way, he saves us. Firstly, he redeems us judicially. We receive uh, the forgiveness of sins, the washing away of our sins. We receive um, justification by life. Christ becomes our righteousness. Um, that is all involved in our judicial redemption. But there's much more to that, according to Romans 5.10. It says we've been reconciled to God by the death of his son. That's part of our judicial redemption. We used to be God's enemies, but because he died on the cross for us, we are no longer God's enemies. We are God's friends. But Romans 5.10 goes on to say much more. We will be saved in his life. This is organic salvation. And what is organic salvation? Organic salvation is when we are saved in his life through regeneration. That means we are born of God in our spirit through sanctification. Uh, we partake of his holy nature. Through renewing, we partake of his divine element. Through transformation, we partake of his divine being. Through confirmation, we partake of his divine image. Eventually, he invades our mortal body and swallows up all the death in our body. And our body of humiliation, according to Philippians 3.21, becomes conformed to the body of his glory. That will be when we are fully glorified and when we are fully manifested as the sons of the living God to the whole universe, so that's why it says God will be happy with our glorification. That is the ultimate consummation of God's good pleasure. Now let me read you these verses from Romans. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the coming glory to be revealed upon us. For the anxious watching of the creation eagerly awaits the revelation of the sons of God. The creation itself will also be free from the slavery of corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans together and travails in pain together until now, and not only so, but we ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan in ourselves, eagerly awaiting sonship, the redemption of our body. So yes, we are the sons of God in our spirit. We are being sunized. I'm coining that word, quote, quote, sunized in our mind, our emotion, and our will until our body, until the redemption of our body, which is our full sonship. That will be our full manifestation as the sons of God and the revelation of the sons of God to this whole universe, that will be when we have fully become the new Jerusalem for the glory of God, the corporate expression of God in this universe, and that is God's good pleasure. Okay, I'll stop here. I hope we have a lot of good testimonies. Thank you, dear brothers and sisters.